Hello everyone, I hope you are well. Now this is a fantastic interview with Ellis Amdur and Bruce Bookman by Tristram at the Modern Aikidoist podcast. Quite how he managed to get the two of them together, I don't know, but a great achievement and these guys are fascinating. Uh, Bruce has got a, a phenomenal history in Aikido and uh, BJJ and, and various other bits and pieces. Ellis is world famous for his writings and uh, again, a very, very accomplished martial artist, Aikido and other, other aspects of martial arts. In this interview, they cover off all sorts of things about the history of Aikido, uh, the importance of cross training, the future and the development of Aikido, their attitudes, how they've, uh, how they've kind of cross pollinated their ideas over the years. This is fascinating. Every single Aikido practitioner should watch this video. Now it's quite long, it's, it's over an hour, so grab yourself a coffee and sit down. You might want to watch it in a couple of sections, but this is absolute gold. Thanks again to Tristram for putting this together. Support his podcast in any way you can and enjoy the video. Welcome to Modern Aikido's podcast. I have a very exciting conversation today with some wonderful guests. Uh, with us are, is Bruce Bookman Sensei and Ellis Amdur Sensei. So welcome to the podcast. We're going to have kind of just a casual conversation today, but we got some very interesting questions to dig into, and I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Uh, so why don't we start with just a, a brief intro for each of you. I know a lot of people have heard your names before, but if they're not familiar, maybe you could uh, give each a bit of a background uh, for your stuff. Sensei Bookman, would you care to start? Sure. Uh, first, I'd like to say uh, I'd like to thank you, uh, Tristan, for uh, inviting us on to the Modern Aikidoist podcast. Uh, it's uh, always uh, nice to be able to have a, a, a new venue for exchanging views. And I'm so happy to be here today, especially with my friend Ellis Amder, and uh, to do this interview. Uh, in terms of my background, um, I've, uh, I've now been doing, uh, since February of last year, that was my 50th year in Aikido. I Congratulations. Started, yeah, thank you. Uh, I started with uh, Yamada Sensei in New York City, Yoshimitsu Yamada, and the first uh, eight years, and then uh, uh, studied at the Humble Dojo in Tokyo, and uh, in particular, a lot with Chiba Sensei. And then after I left Japan, Chiba Sensei and I both came back to America. He set up in San Diego, I set up in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And I've been working, I had been working under him for another 14 years or so, and uh, then uh, basically I went on my own and uh, uh, you know, respectfully departed all the federations and have been going independent for the last 20 years. And um, also I uh, started jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu 25 years ago. Hmm. And you know, during over the entire time I've always cross-trained in one thing or another, not so much in the very beginning years, but especially after I got back from Japan. And, um, you know, a little bit of uh, Taekwondo and Karate, uh, some boxing. Uh, I did a couple of years of training in, in Western style boxing and uh, on and off for quite a few years, even after that. And then uh, Jiu Jitsu training, which I absolutely love as well. And in, over the recent decade, I've been working a lot with trying to connect all the different types of, uh, well, basically jujitsu, Aikido, and some of the boxing, and just a, a little bit of the uh, Muay Thai that uh, I work with my friend, uh, Vaj uh, Grinelli. So uh, anyway, that's uh, basically, that's my background. And I've been running a dojo here for now we're coming up on 40 years. Uh, next year will be the 40th anniversary of Tenzan Aikido. And Congratulations again. Thank you. We have a large children's program and adults program as well. Mm. And uh, one of the, one thing in my background that's in the last 10 years or so that's been very important is my work with Ellis. Mm. And uh, Ellis has an immense background in uh, Japanese weaponry and uh, I have an Aikido background. Most of my weapons comes from Chiba Sensei and also Mitsuzuka Sensei, an Iaido instructor, uh, who was, uh, uh, I trained with while I was in Japan and for several years after that. 
And uh, it's been very meaningful to me to be able to work with Ellis just to, uh, to gain a classical background. And perhaps during our interview, I'll get more into why that's so special for me. Yeah, that is a main, main topic that I wanted to, to bring up with you gentlemen tonight is the, the cross training and the other influences and, and uh, also the collaboration the two of you have had. So perhaps uh, Ender Sensei, you could provide a little bit of uh, your background and how you got to meet up with and start training with, with Bookman Sensei here. So the brief version is I started out as a kid, a typical lost a fight and started doing karate. Uh, and then was doing, uh, uh, trained for a couple of years in a nation of Islam Kung Fu school. Uh, I was their Jewish guy. <laughs> and, uh, and when that school folded, um, went down to New York City, and I was on the way to the headquarters of that school, which wasn't nation of Islam, it was Alan Lee, one of the first um, Chinese uh, background people to teach non-Chinese, you know, traditional arts. I was walking to his school and halfway there I got tired. It was a hot summer day and I walked into this Aikido school. And the first thing I saw was Bruce. And what I saw was a 16 year old kid. I won't say what you said, but <laughs> <laughs> you said something really nasty to this, uh, uh, third Don, uh, Klaus, and he grabbed a bokken and was chasing Bruce around the dojo, trying to hit him, and Bruce was dodging. His, uh, his multiple attack skills, his evasion skills were sublime. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the first thing I saw in Aikido, uh, an older man attacking a kid with a bokken. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, now I saw the Aikido class and it, I've been very interested in Chinese martial arts almost exclusively, but really what got me about Aikido was the aesthetic. Uh, what I mean by the aesthetic was um, the Japanese uh, <clears throat> cultural container which the martial art wa was held, uh, the way people bowed, the way people moved. Uh, it really, there was something about that that just compelled me. Um, and I'd actually been looking for that uh, ever since I'd seen a movie called Yojimbo Meets Zatoichi, uh, which I'd seen several years before. And it just, the Mufune character seemed to me the exemplar of all I was not. Uh, mm -hmm. this, this contained individual who knew the right thing to do at every moment and never hesitated. Mm -hmm. Never speeded up either, but just that impeccable action. And that's what I was looking for. And, you know, it seemed to offer that in Aikido. And then I went through a period of about five years where I trained probably eight hours a day. Uh, a couple of years in, you know, I was in New York a few years. I lived in Terry Dobson's dojo and I would always go up to 18th street as well where Bruce was. So uh, I don't think we met each other again, or maybe we saw each other on the map, but hardly, you know, I was much junior to him actually. Um, I was just a geeky hippie kid at the time. And uh, um, then I went to Japan and for two years I was commuting between five different dojos, including the Aikikai. My biggest influences were Komori Yasunori, uh, who ran the oldest Shibu dojo, oldest branch dojo of the Aikikai. Um, Kuruiwa Yoshio, who was uh, an ex-professional boxer. And there's a long story about him I won't get into, but he basically blended um, every one of his Aikido movements was on a figure eight of hooks and uppercuts, never extended an arm. Mm -hmm. So all, it was all in this figure eight kind of movement. Uh, Nisho Shoji, those are my three main influences. Uh, shortly after I arrived in Japan, I started doing something called Arakiryu. And Arakiryu um, is an art that dates back to 16th century. And the best way to sort of sum it up is it's uh, sumo with weapons. Uh, mm -hmm. It's close grappling. In a sense, we do fight at a distance, but the moment of impact is where our art really starts, mm -hmm. which is similar to any kind of grappling, but now you have a weapon involved, right? Mm -hmm. So I started doing that, and I started doing something called Todaha Bukoryu, which was the exact opposite. 
um, and was always trying to stay at blade's edge to somebody and focused around the naginata, mm. uh, which is a long pole with a curved blade. Haraki, you had it too, but it was very schizophrenic. Um, and literally, I mean, I was, I was so committed to Aikido, I quit Aikido. Um, mm. I, form, I, I, mean, I did something that I think the Japanese thought was very odd. I requested a meeting of Osawa Sensei, and I formally resigned the Aikikai, <laughs> you know? Okay. <laughs> you know, as opposed to not showing up anymore, you know, I was uh, so serious. Mm. And he was rather puzzled by the whole thing, but, uh, you know, very kind about it. Sure. Um, so I started doing Aikido, and I got to say, you know, with these old schools, it's not just a matter of doing different technique. Um, it gets down into your sinews, it gets down to your nervous system, into your mind. And it's almost impossible to do too, because a lot of people do, but it's, they make them generic. It's just, they're doing movements and they homogenize it all because the, the essence of them is a little, it's a, on the nervous system level. So literally, I was the assistant instructor of Nita Sensei, my Toda Habukaru school. I've been training with her 11 years. And as far as I'm concerned, I never once had done a Toda Habukaru kata. It looked like it, she was happy with it, but inside I was doing Arakiju. Mm -hmm. And I will never forget, there was one day I was training and I did <clears> a movement <throat> and it was like all these dominoes shifted inside me. And I felt something I'd never felt before. And it was like, oh, that's Toda Habukoryu. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's a term that's kind of popular these days, code switching. Um, literally when I'm doing Arakiju, I don't even think of Toda Habukoryu. I'm doing Toda Abukoryu, I don't imagine Arakiryu. It's the, mm. just, when I'm doing something freestyle, it all blends. But, sure. so just to quickly finish up, I was also cross training like Bruce. I, I did a couple years Muay Thai at Koei Gym in uh, Tokyo. I was doing uh, a few years of Judo with Tokai University's Branch High School. Mm. Uh, I was at that time about 215 pounds. And when the students, I was, I was an te English teacher there, and when the kids, the high school team, would line up by weight, I didn't even go halfway. Wow. There were 350-pound kids, you know, prepping for the Olympics, amazing school. Um, did a lot of Chinese martial arts, singing Bagua. Quickly, to come back, I come back to America, and I was borrowing a friend's school, and he had a bunch of Aikido teachers teaching there. He was one, he had other guys teaching. Mm -hmm. And he was going on a long vacation, and he asked me to take his Aikido school. Uh, while I, he was gone, I said, I don't do that. And I, I'm not interested. And he said, you owe me, which is a problem because I pay my debts. And I said, well, why don't you have one of the other guys do it? And he says, because I'm afraid they're going to steal my students. That's the way they are. Mm -hmm. And so I was started doing Aikido again as a favor to him. And I just found it fascinating all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, my attitude has been, I'm not an Aikidoka, I'm a guest. And I want to be a really respectful guest. So I'm going to respect the form. I'm not going to say to an Aikido class, well, you guys do Shomenuchi, but you should be doing a jab. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say that. Mm -hmm. But what I'm going to say is knowing whatever I've acquired on the use of a body, if I could tune up your Shomenuchi so it's in some way more powerful without in any way trespassing on the form, then I feel like I'm being a good guest. Mm -hmm. So... That's been my attitude with Aikido. And, you know, I've taught off and on here and there. I have no school of that. Um, Bruce and I got together and originally we're doing an exchange where I was uh, showing him and we were working out with Arakiryu, uh, a sword in particular, right? Did we do anything else or mostly sword? We did, yeah, mostly sword, yeah, that's right. Uh, we, we did the uh, sword, we did some uh, bow. Right, right, right. Some kusurigama. That's right. That's right. You like that, didn't you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Bruce was teaching me BJJ. Okay. Um, you know, unfortunately, my body's kind of broken down and, you know, it's even light. Some things just don't work for me anymore. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Bruce, come, you know, sort of to tie everything together, Bruce came in one day and he had on, I think it was on his phone, he had some videos of Shiba Sensei's uh, uh, Joe Kata. Mm -hmm. And uh, he forwarded them to me and asked what I thought. And in advance, I'm going to apologize to any partisans of, of Chief Sensei's work, which I highly respect, but I'm a professional. I'm going to give my professional opinion. Um, I came back and I said, there's some really powerful stuff, and he is really good, mm -hmm. but I don't like it. 
And Bruce was like, why? And I said, it appears to me he's teaching his students to lose. There seemed to me to be movements in the kata where the only thing the student could do to keep the kata going was flinch away or be hit. Mm. Um, and it seemed stacked up that way to me. Now, other people watching this may totally disagree. I respect your disagreement. Mm -hmm. That was just what it appeared to me. And Bruce and I were just going back and forth. And he said, well, what would you do differently? And we just started fooling around in the beginning with, you know, some Joe. Mm -hmm. And then before you know it, it was like we both, something lit up for us. And it's like, hey, we could, nobody said anything. It was just we started combining all the things we knew and just working on something new. You know, and I would start tripping on something and Bruce would look at me and say, well, is it good for Aikido? You know, because they, they were supposed to be Aiki forms, you know, because um, I would sort of spin off and he'd say, would this help my students do Aikido? Right? And it was a great, it's like any art has to have a container. And that question for both of us gave us a container. So we just weren't all over the place. Sure. And that kind of bridges to what uh, one of the main questions I wanted to ask both of you, which is uh, with, with uh, Bruce, if I can call you guys by your first names, that's, that's okay. Um, I know that, that you put together your extensions program, which uh, is a video program, I think through a Aikido journal. Is that right? Yes, um, yes. That talks about uh, you adapting Aikido to deal with punches, jabs, like from a boxer uh, kind of a more well, uh, I'd say well-rounded, but also influenced from other martial arts. And I think some of the pushback I've seen from the kind of heavy duty Aikido purists believe that those outside influences can pollute their Aikido, or they seem to, to recoil against the idea of having their Aikido deal with boxing attacks or with wrestling attacks or jujitsu attacks, other things like that. And they kind of just, they don't want to really go into that direction. So I'm wondering from your standpoint, if you've run across that attitude, number one, and two, after doing this for uh, 10, 15 years that you've been doing the, the blending, have you found that it has disturbed your Aikido? Certainly it's altered it, but has it, have you had to make any sacrifices uh, from the Aikido standpoint, or do you just feel that those influences have made your Aikido better? Well, first I'll start off by saying that the notion that uh, many uh, a purist, if you want to call them that, in Aikido, that this type of uh, exploration and training will somehow uh, 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 ruin their Aikido or make it impure, that's, there is some merit to that, actually. And that's been one thing that I've been very careful about. You know, uh, I love the classical practice of Aikido, if you can say that it's something that's only maybe 75 years old. Is that, can that be classical? But uh, because it's an eclectic art by its very nature, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but there's still, just as uh, Ellis was saying about that feeling that he had when everything with the Toda you know, Ryu, when everything all of a sudden went and he said, ah, that's it. That's the art. Um, there's that in Aikido as well. And for me, that's very strong. And the danger I find, because you see a lot of people who are trying to adapt karate and boxing and things to Aikido, but what happens is that they start looking like karate guys or, or, or boxers doing Aikido movements. They don't really look like they inhabit the body of Aikido. And uh, that's why I'm always careful to say, do this Aikido extensions work that I do, do that 10% of the time. 90% mm. of the time work your grooves. And uh, there's, there's a realistic element, a, a tempering of your uh, a psyche that can happen and ought to be happening uh, with the classical Aikido. It's just very difficult to be your own sheriff like that. You really have to have a lot of integrity to be riding that line in your classical practice and seeing Shomei Uchi as something other than just this stilted attack. 
So, uh, so classical training, ikkyo, nikkyo, sankyo, yankyo, gokyo, iriminage, and these things are, must be practiced the way a, a concert pianist still plays the scale on the piano. When do they stop playing the scale? Never. And why? Because there's a feel that comes along with it. So what I've strived to do with the Aikido extensions is to maintain this feel, the way I feel when I do katate dori, tai no henko. I want to put that feel into how I respond to a left jab. And the, really the one part that I've been working on and I don't see anybody else doing to the same extent is on trying is on applying I key principles and getting that comfortable feeling, getting those grooves when you don't know what attack is coming in. Mm. You know, I don't. That see is the big attack. challenge. You know, and I, and I keep hoping that they'll. You know, I'm an older guy. I'm not gonna. I don't want. I don't intend for my students, or and I don't claim to be doing hardcore mixed martial arts. Or if you train with me, you'll be prepared for mixed martial arts. What you'll be prepared for is self-defense. That's my, my goal, is that by the time someone gets a black belt in my school, they will be able, if they're surprised, if they don't know what's coming at them, they will have their instincts developed and they'll be able to bring their classical core into their practice. So it won't be something so foreign, but it'll just be another day of practice. Mm. You see? That's very similar to the goal that I have with my own students. And I had to really reorient, uh, even though my lineage comes from Bill Sosa sensei and he, he was a boxer previously. And so he really melded, uh, real world attacks, boxing attacks into his Aikido. And even, even from there, I think that there was farther to go. And it's a shame that he passed so early because I think he brought that, that same type of type of attitude very much of the, I don't want my students to, to uh, be caught short when they need to defend themselves. Right, uh, absolutely. <clears throat> and uh, in the, where the, the practice blends is, I have appreciated so much the work of the Gracies. Very much so. But what impressed me when I first saw them, uh, saw footage of them, was how they could close the, the distance on a fairly sophisticated fighter, a mm -hmm. striker take them down to the floor and really in a very civilized way end the fight. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't really like the slam, ground and slam kind of stuff that's going on in the MMA now. It, it, it's not that it's a bad thing. It's just, it, it doesn't interest me as much as just the pure art of closing the distance on a striker in a way that's, that a civilized person, someone who's not, not somebody, who could be an accountant can come in and learn basic principles and be able to defend themselves against uh, an, at, uh, an attack that they have no idea what's coming their way. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're not going to become mixed martial artists. But if they do decide to get into mixed martial arts, they'll have to go through this process. This will, this will be a good foundation anyway. And that's what, that's what I've been trying to do. Yeah, the concept of that entry is is the paradox of how do you close. What I realized years ago is that Aikido has a preferred range. It's not a what I would I used to call C range, which is out at out at the edge of range, where you're you're getting these long long attacks like long jabs. And Aikidoist really wants to get close. That's where he does his work. A lot like a judoka, they want to they want to get their body in close, and that's where you start using leverage. But the challenge is how do you enter there with a good striker? Because that's you got to cross through his danger zone to get there, and how do you do it safely uh, against somebody who's skilled? So that's a that's a good good approach, definitely. And th and things have gotten so uh, 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 stylistic, and also uh, you, you have to become an expert in many different areas these days. Mm -hmm. No longer can you just be a karateka and expect to be able to do much in an MMA situation. You can't even be a jiu-jitsu guy who only does sport jiu-jitsu, mm -hmm. which is what most jiu-jitsu is now. Yeah. 
And you, you, you have to combine things. So people, I think, when they speak about Aikido should remember that there's no one art that's a panacea of mixed martial arts or even self-defense. Mm -hmm. And that we borrow from each other and we incorporate it and we have our own, uh, Ellis has a word for this. It's, it's like a scent, a Japanese word that's- uh, a Kusei. Yeah. Kusei. Kusei. Yeah. Uh -huh. And it can either be a scent or an odor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, you know, but Aikido has its own kusei. And I, I, I think that the, that's a very important thing to gain that, that feel as you incorporate other things. Sure. So. Ellis, do you have a comment to throw in there? It seems like you've got a very uh, eclectic background. So we're not necessarily with you approaching this purely from an Aikido standpoint, but you have a lot to say about bringing other influences together. I liked your... Sure. your combinations that you were talking about but at the same time I, I do want to respect the house here so yes. um, mm -hmm. for example right now we and I think it's going to get worse before it gets better um, we've got cities that are in turmoil and yes, Aikido actually prepares people a little better for what we see on the street right now than BJJ because you know if you have to negotiate a riot situation to simply escape and evade. If you've never practiced escape and evade, deflecting people, uncontrolled people, a mob, you know, directing one person in the way of the person swinging at you with a skateboard so you can book off to the side, seems to me all of a sudden Aikido is very relevant for self-defense in a way that a lot of our gladiator sports are not. Not to say you want to eliminate that, mm -hmm. but Whenever people talk about martial arts, you got to talk about um, for what? You know, self-defense for what? What are your conditions? Mm -hmm. You know, um, capoeira is considered like, a, you know, an artifact, a folk art, right? Mm -hmm. uh, BJJ beats capoeira all the time, the two Brazilian martial arts. Well, go up to the favela. Okay, now everybody's got guns. But go up the favela 30, 40, 50 years ago. One, you were not fighting one-on-one -on -one in little, uh, a little scuffle. They were gang fights. And the whole thing about Kapoor only uses its feet, that's because people used to carry a straight razor in each hand and all those kind of delicate movements like this. That's a slash with a straight razor in a crowd. And so Kapoor has the best evasive movements to go all the way back to West Africa where there was a special squad of warriors. They were called runners. And based on the way of African warfare, they were throwing spears at each other and it was a loose formation. And the runner's goal was to dodge spears that were thrown at them, get inside the ranks of the enemy and kill a superior officer or the king. Because that would be, in the culture they had, that that would be devastating to their military if they lost their ranking people. Mm -hmm. And so the roots of that kind of evasive movement, uh, there's an account in uh, a British officer journal from about 1820, the British had some kind of war in Argentina and this officer writes something like um, uh, Afro-Argentinian, I don't know what word to use, broke through the ranks with a spear fighting in the African style. We kept trying to shoot him and missed. He killed a number of our people before he was brought down. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's Aikido is a manifestation of um, a martial art that was created for a certain culture. Now that we live in a different culture, um, there is, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, the different, it's not cultural appropriation, it's cultural respect, but at the same time, there has to be some consideration to the world and place we live in. Um, so for me, uh, I mean, the two people I think in my, that I've met in my lifetime who have extended the borders of Aikido while maintaining that, what Bruce calls say, are Bruce, well, number one, and two, Nishio Shoji sensei. Um, the Nishio Shoji, uh, you know, was a judoka, he was a karateka, and, and his Aikido was incredibly complex. It's pretty hard to learn uh, effectively, but it was still Aikido. Mm -hmm. right? And I guess one more thing, we have a dilemma, and 
it's interesting. Bruce and I fall on, in our practice, I, I think we fall a little bit on two sides of this dilemma. Uh, the one side is the Aikido we were bequeathed in to a large degree is Ueshiba Kishomaru's Aikido. Mm -hmm. And and I respect him so highly. Every people, it's it's fashionable to criticize him. World War II is over. His father practiced a sectarian, narrow art that was good for a few people. And Japan's trying to recover from World War II. And Kishimoto Sensei knew what to pair away of his father's wacky ideas, mm -hmm. um, what, what to refine. And he made an art that literally has transformed the world, right? It, I mean, it, it informs movement systems, it informs people's psychology. You know, he was equally a great, as great a man as Ueshiba, uh, Murihei. And so on the one hand, but at the same time, in paring it down, this question of martial virtue, right? So back to what you said, Tristan, it's almost like the three combat ranges. There's the pugilistic range, there's arm's length grappling range, which is Aikido, and then there's body-to-body -body grappling range, which is Judo and uh, Jujutsu. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the previous generation of great Aikidoka were also Judoka. So they had confidence in close. Mm -hmm. But, you know, many Aikidoka are going to be helpless if somebody gets too close and helpless if they're too far away. There's just this one range that is suitable. And if, if one wants, to, but the goal is, can I, can I, can you do Aikido at that close range? Can you do Aikido at the far range? Mm -hmm. The last thing I want to say is the other question is, how about if you're really curious about what Ueshiba Murihei was doing? And, you know, okay, not, not the, um, the, uh, the, the worship of gods as he did, but in terms of the, the way he used his body to generate really startling power. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and certainly for those of you who know, I, I've written a number of books and one of them is called Hidden in Plain Sight which is an attempt to point out that Ueshiba, I believe, uh, had a particular methodology of training. And I believe that from my perspective, Ueshiba's Aikido was using the Aikido technique to train the body to generate more power. It wasn't the Waza at all, in my view. Sure. Right? Um, and he didn't teach people that. A few people picked it up by osmosis. Most people just you know, looked at the movement and followed the movement. And so there's two really intriguing avenues of powering up your Aikido, in my view. The one is, is Bruce's path, which, you know, if I was still doing Aikido, I'd be in your dojo every day, you know, in terms of learning Aikido. Um, what I actually do is I, I devote a considerable amount of time to very specialized exercises so that I can, um, uh, I have the ability uh, to develop the ability, for example, to um, cause damage to a joint when I'm already touching the joint or um, a strike when I already have contact with the person with a relaxed body, mm -hmm. things like that. And that just happens to be a fascination of mine. Ueshiba inspired me. I'm not trying to do Ueshiba's Aikido, but he inspired me to go look for that stuff. Mm -hmm. Sure. The, I, have um, say, I have to say that I working with uh, Ellis because uh, uh, we had uh, lots of opportunity to working close both with the weapons and without. But the uh, feeling of uh, Ellis was talking about we were doing Tenshinage one day, mm -hmm. or we used Tenshinage as an example of how to connect contact and then use the whole body to strike. And this is something that's been very inspiring about Ellis's work that I've enjoyed and you've gotten a lot out of and have used that in my own way, uh, in my own particular uh, 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 way that I proceed with Aikido training and work with my students. Sure. One was, of the questions I had for, for Ellis, maybe to jump track just a little bit, um, I remember just recently I saw a, a video that you did and I think the video was filmed fairly recently, but it was a, a, a story that you told in an article from years ago about um, an instructor and, and forgive me, I don't remember his name, but it was after a demonstration and uh, this I guess was back in the 60s or something where uh, there was a demonstration done, a bunch of other martial artists were watching it 
And afterwards, a number of the Aikido instructors got together and he stood up and basically said, um, I think showing sword disarms to a oh. bunch of sword fighters <laughs> makes us look like fools. And this is just, we should stop doing this. And maybe you could, you could elaborate on the story because I'm just giving the basic Reader's Digest version of it. Okay, so one of my teachers, as I mentioned, was Kuriwa Yoshio. And he was a fascinating, tragic figure. Mm. Um, he started Aikido about six months after Kato Hiroshi. Kato Hiroshi broke his arm in his first class. Mm. Um, it was, Kato was 17 at the time. And Kuriwa told me that Kato's mother dragged him by the ear over to Kuriwa's mother and made him apologize. So, but Kuriwa had been a, um, a roughneck downtown boy professional boxer and he had that downtown kid ghetto kids attitude and he found most of the aikido people middle class um arrogant people who you know i could tell stories all day about this stuff but um he used to talk about how enormously powerful tohei sensei was tohei koichi unbelievably physically powerful with not just muscle power but you know whole body connected power mm -hmm. and he got into it with tohei sensei because tohei uh, kuriwa used to have a little thing at the aikikai all the uchi deshi and soto deshi would get together and kuriwa was already showing six months here's what i'm doing with boxing and all this stuff and the uchi deshi loved it and uh, tohei sensei was very offended mm -hmm. and so he comes up and he says to him you have no key and uh, Kuriwa, who was just a kid, but he looks at him and says, so I'm supposed to stick up my finger and buzz you with some electricity? I don't believe in that crap. To the Shihan Butcho of the dojo. So the next day, uh, he comes to the dojo to work out with his buddies, and nobody's there. Nobody's there except Chiba Sensei, because he was the only one with the courage. And Chiba Sensei is just a kid. I don't even think he was 20 at the time. And he's crying he's sitting there and says that his fists are clenched and he's crying and uh uh kuri sensei was older and was kind of actually chiba's mentor in a way because ichi chideshi and soto deshi mentored a younger guy hmm. um poor terry dobson was mentored by chiba sensei which there's whole stories about that but uh um and chiba and, and kuri was like chichan what, what's what's up going on and chiba said Toy sensei said, either don't show up for his class or mess him up. And uh, the next thing, Kuriwa says, Tohei! He goes yelling, looking at him, looking for him. And Toy, Toy, Toy sensei shows up, what do you want? He says, come in the office, says, Kuriwa. So they sit down, and Kuriwa starts loudly saying, you say in World War II, you let a squad of guys from the front and your key was enough so you could always detect before the enemy showed up and so nobody was ever shot. He says, that's bullshit. You, you stood in the front because when they were ambushing, they would wait to see who else came. And when they opened up, you would duck down, let other people get shot. Now, no idea if that's true or anything like that, but it's fighting words. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, so Tohei is like um, rising out of his seat, you know, says a seat, and all of a sudden, O-sensei shows up. Just bops in the office. Hi, boys. What are you here for? Would you, this Korea is telling me. She says, would you guys like some tea? Would you like some tea? Um, hey, let me get some tea. And Korea is like, well, couldn't fight him. And I said, do you really think you could win? And he says to me, all those guys, they were strong boys, but they didn't know how to fight. Mm -hmm. So his perspective was, you know, I've been f street fighting since I was a kid. He used to, as a junior high school boy, he would go down to the Ginza, which wasn't the fancy place it was now, and he would pick fights with college kids, knock them out in an alleyway, and take the button off their university cap. He said he had two shopping bags full of these buttons. Mm. And, and he said one day he was on a train, and there's some guy looking at him, an older guy, and smiling at him. And he keeps saying, who is this guy? Do I know him? And the guy looks at him and says, uh, Hey, you don't remember me, do you? He goes, no. He says, a couple years ago, you left me unconscious in a pile of garbage in the Ginza. Take care of yourself, kid. He walks out. 
And Kuriwa said he couldn't stop shivering for 24 hours because hmm. he said, I can remember the guys' faces who beat me, but there must be hundreds of guys walking around Tokyo that I shamed, that I treated like crap, and I don't even know who they are. Any one of them could walk up to me and stab me. And he realized for the first time he was in a, a bad road, right? He hmm. sought out Aikido because he heard something about this man and the art of peace and all that. And he said, there's something I don't know that I got to learn. But he's still a downtown kid, right? right. So to the, that was, I'm sorry for the background, but it makes, it, this is necessary to put, put some, some context to it. Yeah. And so all the Shihan would have these meetings at various times. Kuryu was this reluctant Shihan. <laughs> he was a white belt and kept refusing to take any rank and finally, Kishomaru said, you've got to take rank because it's embarrassing. I'm sending you out to dojos to teach. And the Udansha are offended they're being taught by a white belt. And so anyway, he ended up, so he was a Rokudani. He never would take any more. Um, it's this kind of downtown humility. It's a kind of arrogant humility you'd see in mm -hmm. guys who were brought up poor in Japan. So he's at this meeting, and I guess he was kind of chafing at everybody, blah, 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 blah. He says, ah. Oh, uh, point of order. You know, I was watching the All Japan tournament this year and everybody's taking swords away from people and, you know, avoiding getting stabbed and things like that. And there's professional swordsmen in the audience. I think it's really disrespectful to those people that we're acting like we could actually beat them. I think we should cut that out. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's like dead silence. Just dead silence. And it goes on and on and on. And then somebody, probably Osala sensei, uh, just changed the subject. It sounds like he had a more diplomatic delivery than he did with Tohei. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't mad, you know, but he was just being a provocateur. Sure. Um, and afterwards he said, Saito sensei came up to him, slapped him on the back and said, I'm glad you said that. Mm -hmm. And Kuriya said to me, yeah, he said it, but. He didn't change anything. Nobody ever changed anything. Mm -hmm. So that's the story. And that, that last sentence is the most profound part that, I, that struck me of the story. It, wasn't, it definitely took courage for him to say that. But the fact that it was, A, it was true. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you show people that are swordsmen, basically a, a patterned, choreographed disarm that against a kendoist or against somebody with with an a, with an active will to kill you with a sword would be a whole different matter than than practicing a choreographed and i love playing around with sword disarms and and whatnot but i also realize if you had even a 10 year old that had a couple of red bulls in them and a sharp katana you'd get carved into sushi before you'd get to them um, but, I, but but i also have to be fair mm -hmm. um i've got a a blog called for here's my plug it's called kogenbudo.org. Mm -hmm. And I publish some of my own writing there. And I also publish other people's writing. And there's a police officer from Adelaide, uh, Australia, who started, he trained in Japan. He, he mostly did Tomiki Aikido. And he also did uh, Shingi and Bagua and Tai Chi. Mm -hmm. Those were his main things. And he became a police officer about age 30. And he, in Australia, you can't draw a weapon very often. I mean, you have to be handy. Sure. And I asked him to write an article about all the time he used pure classic technique mm -hmm. and tell the stories. And so he's got stories where a guy would try this or that with a weapon or this or that. And he said, ah, oh, this one would be Tomikisi's uh, da, 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 da. Oh, that would be Singi's tiger claw or whatever. But he would break it down. He'd show a photograph, a series of photographs with a student of what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, speaking as somebody who's trained so dedicated with certain weaponry, there's one side of me that cringes a bit, more than a bit, when I see certain weapon disarm stuff. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you are patterning responses that actually could work, not against a professional swordsman, but against somebody swinging a skateboard at you, right. against somebody swinging a, a uh, a stick at you uh, against some unskilled person suddenly trying to stab you with something. Mm -hmm. The patterns of movement are the patterns you would need. Mm -hmm. And so Kuriwa Sensei was right, but he was wrong.
Sure. Yeah, I can see that there are, I mean, there are diff different perspectives that you can look on it. Um, and I think this was, if I remember right, this date was, this was like in the 60s. Is that right? Yeah, like that was a long time ago, which, which you know, and it, it seems like that was a time when this, the 60s still had a high level of potency with the Aikido practice from the people that I've talked to that have trained at that time. They said that training in the 50s and 60s was not like a lot of the training is now. It has really, the intensity level has toned down quite a bit. There's a lot of stories of, you know, people coming out of practices with chipped teeth and, and uh, fat lips and bruises, you know, heavy bruising and, and, and some blood, things like that. Uh, whereas a more modern practice that is not very common, admittedly, not even on my own dojo, I don't want to do that. Um, but it seems I've in the dojos that I've visited in the classes that I have visited, it's toned down so much. I've seen entire practices go where nobody breaks a sweat. Like it seems like a casual walk through uh, sort of thing. And, and um, I think that year, a few years, decades of that drift has created an even farther distance than what he was commenting about at that time back in the 60s. Yeah, but you go to different dojo. You go to Bruce's dojo and it's a swamp. There's so much sweat. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, I mean, yeah, everybody practices it a little a different way. And, and I, I do admire those people that are kind of carrying the, the torch for that more intense, focused practice on dealing with the chaos. And, and, and I loved how, how Bruce, you described the, how do you deal with, with somebody when you don't know what they're about to throw? Because that really is the paradox. My background, I have more than 25 years in a full combat uh, competition art. So dealing, reading an opponent and, and anticipating them, uh, leading them, baiting them, things like that are the parts that, to, in my mind, get lost with the, just the paired kata where you just practice the physical movements. Um, the, they're, they're, it's great to work on that precision, but there's a lot to when do you use it? under what conditions do you use it? And I think that's, that struck me as you were describing earlier about how, what is your Aikido when you don't know what's about to happen? Right. Well, you know, I spoke about self-defense. Mm -hmm. Then I thought about what have been my own needs for self-defense. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as an adult, uh, the only time that I've ever been assaulted was by a Japanese Aikido instructors wearing a gi. Okay. So when I went to Japan, I had a little, maybe a couple of months in Gleason's gym in New York City in terms of boxing, but not very much. I did, you know, a couple of months of Taekwondo, not very much, a little bit of Judo with uh, Higashi Sensei at the New York Buddhist Academy, but Again, not very much. But what I had behind me was eight years of Aikido with Yamada Sensei. He, he was my, like a dad to me in many ways and was very kind and didn't really want me to go to Japan, but I went to Japan anyway. But the problem I ran into was uh, I, within the, the parameters of Aikido, and as long as we stuck to those parameters, I was a pretty tough guy in terms of Aikido. I had a really strong wrist. If I didn't want anybody, I could give somebody my arm and they could do a kodigaishi or whatever and I could resist. And what I experienced uh, with the Uchi Deshi at Humble Dojo, it was, uh, it was uh, Miyamoto, um, Yokota, and Osawa Jr., to name three. Uh, but like I would work out with, uh, with some of these guys, uh, Miyamoto in particular, sometimes a little bit with the Shibata Sensei. And it was very hard training. But if, uh, and they would resist, but if I would resist back, they would, so it almost felt like they got angry at me and then they wanted to fight. They would, you know, want to punch me in the mouth or, or do something like that. And like, you know, working with high, high ranking Brazilian Jiu Jitsu guys, if you manage to sweep them or do something to them, they, I don't care. Mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, you know, even if you manage, maybe they, maybe you've managed to tap them once. Mm -hmm. 
they're, you know, they, they pat you on the back and they're so pleased. The next round might be a bit harder, but you know, it's all within the context of training. Where it was, when I did something to uh, challenge the Aikido instructors on the mat, they got visibly upset with me and they wanted to fight me. They did not like me when I did that. Hmm. I was no longer a training partner, but I was this schmuck, you know, who they had to stomp out. Or a challenger. A challenger, yeah. And, uh, and other than Aikido, I didn't really have any background. Hmm. I remember going to uh, one of the dojos that was kind of more aggressive, and my teacher told me, pointed at this one senpai and said, sick him. And the guy had done Aikido much longer than I had, and he, had a, he was a fighter. I'm going to sick him with what? He knows Kodigaishi as well as I know Kodigaishi. Plus, he's been in 100 street fights. I'm going to sick him? You know? So that was a, really a dilemma for me. So I had the, and I, you know, usually what would happen is I'd just take the Ukemi, and they would resist against me, and I go, oh, oh, you're amazing, you know, and then that's, that's how it went. Kind of feed the ego a little bit, and, and uh... I respect the pecking order, although I was actually senior to some of these guys, but mm -hmm. they didn't respect that, because I didn't come from the, the headquarters corporation, you know, there's a corporation, and if you come up in the headquarters, you're considered an executive of some higher degree than somebody who's in a branch of the corporation, you know, and it, that's kind of how it was there. And although I think, you, you know, being a, a, a non-Japanese also played into it at that time. Mm -hmm. So when I came back to the States, it really wasn't until the thirties that I started studying boxing seriously and also jujitsu. And my goal was, was just to uh, develop my, my short term goal was to develop a self-defense against the uh, Aikido instructors who wanted to fight when their technique was That's hilarious. <laughs> the only reason. Yeah. I have to break in on story. Aikido guys. <laughs> you you know, know, Bruce and I overlapped a little bit in, the, the, in Japan. I'm not going to name the guy. I'll tell you later, Bruce. But, mm. <laughs> but one, of the, uh, one of the young teachers, uh, I was working out with a guy named Chris Smart. It was a former SAS guy for British. It, it, oh, he's a strong guy. Very genial guy. And we were working out. It was Yote Mochi Kokyu Nage, you know, that thing. And uh, so we're working out, and we're making it difficult for each other. And uh, so the uh, instructor comes over, young instructor. And uh, so... He tells me to grab hold of him. I grab hold. And uh, yeah, I'm taking good ukemi, but I'm giving him juice. And he throws me. And then he says, go ahead, you throw me. And so I start to throw him. And he hunches over. You know, he just sort of makes himself into a little hunch, right? And there's no way I'm going to pick him up. And I wasn't even thinking. I'd already started training on Akiryu. And the reflex took over. And I got behind him, shook my hand loose, got him in a rear naked choke, dropped backwards, put the hooks in. And I'm like this. Oh. And I'm thinking. It's pretty much done. Game over. Well, no, I, no, no. It's just beginning. What, oh, what really? Do okay. Do, right? Do I right. choke him out? Okay. <laughs> he's going to kill me or try to, right? Or he's going to get all his friends. Or do I let him up? And I'm thinking. And like. Chris and a couple other guys are standing around, they're all going like, ah, oh, okay. And I let him up. Okay. And I'll never forget it. He looked at me with this absolutely puzzled look. Like, what just happened? What did you just do? And he just like shook his head and he walked away. Mm -hmm. I never had any trouble with that particular person again. <laughs> but... You know, it was just the right moment, the right time, the right stars. He was probably hung over. <laughs> well. but, but, yeah, I know exactly what Bruce is talking about, that an idealistic martial art where, you know, it's like when Bruce and I started doing BJJ, 
I was proud. Seriously, I mean, from beginning to end, when I could go 30 seconds and he hadn't tapped me, I was so proud of myself, mm -hmm. literally, right? Yeah. I knew exactly where I stood. I couldn't argue it. I couldn't say, oh, I wasn't ready uh, uh, or you attacked wrong. Mm -hmm. You can't do that, right? right? When I was doing Muay Thai, I knew when I got kicked, right? But when you have an idealistic martial art where skill is kind of an abstract, a lot of people get insecure with their rank, right? Because if somebody, you know, can take, uh, if a shodan can drop you and you're a sandan, is your rank real? Yeah. I used to watch um, at Tokai High School. Mm -hmm. The judo instructor was a six don. The assistant instructor was world sambo silver medalist the high school kids were throwing them regularly. You know, Min, uh, Mario Sperry at one point was like the god of MMA, G, uh, BJJ, right? Do, do, do you know their name? No, right? I'm not familiar. Um, he's you know, about 30 years back, but Mario Sperry, there was a point when he was the number one MMA BJJ guy. Mm. And Minotaro came up in the same uh, gym, I believe. Mm -hmm. When Minotaro had been playing three years, he fought Mario Sperry, who was 36 years old, and the three-year kid beat the guy. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you get older, right? Mm -hmm. and, and in a real, real, in a martial art where you're absolutely clear what your skill is not, you accept that. Sure. Right? But there's, there is something toxic that can come up with an idealistic martial art because it's like you ask yourself am i fronting mm -hmm. do, do i merit this and then when somebody young foot sweeps you or you know stops your technique instead of saying i'm so glad you're getting so strong it's like many people feel like the position's been threatened you know that, that i'm glad you bring that up because that goes back to my experience when i had people come up under me i, I had seniors above me that were better but when there was a a big spread between how good you think you are and how good you actually are, the bigger that spread gets, the more you have an ego problem to deal with, or the more you feel like, well, I thought I was this good and I'm really that good and I'm angry about it. And you can either express it by the guy who showed you that you weren't this good because he was, he was that good and you were down here, or you, you kind of live that delusion until that gets shattered. And when it shatters, it's always painful. It's always, <laughs> it always hurts inside because having gone through the same thing, you know, I'd go through those times where, wow, I'm doing really good. And I'd run across somebody who would light me up and be like, oh boy, what was that? But it was a constant hammering on your ego to keep you hum uh, humble because yeah, I'm you laughing know, because um, can just run away. Years, I was working out with a guy who, um, it was uh, he did another style of classical Japanese jiu-jitsu, but he had been a pretty powerful Greco-Roman wrestler grow, growing up. He was a very powerful man, but he really didn't have a ground game. Mm. And that I was tapping him out regularly since Bruce knows how much of a ground game I have. He really didn't have a ground game. Mm. Uh, he kept sticking his head into uh, uh, a guillotine choke and things oh, like yeah. that. And so I was tapping him again and again and again, and he was physically stronger than me and all that. And one day we're rolling. And he gets me in a neck crank and tap. Mm -hmm. And he jumps up and he says, I got to go home. I'm going on the internet. I just <laughs> tapped out Ellis Amder and I'm going to let the world know. <laughs> no, no, no. We have to go. And he says, no, no, I'm gone. I'm gone. Yeah, I'm good now, Ellis. I'm good. <laughs> right. And I'm out. I got leave it on a high note. <laughs> One more. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, you know, and having started a few of these discussions and participated in them uh, over the years and did a podcast episode on, like, what are the, the benefits of a competitive venue or some kind of a, of a tangible, uh, a ta some type of a tangible measure by which somebody can test their skills? Not necessarily a, a sport, but, for example, even a, a spirited randori, and, and I started doing with my students a what I call a one uke randori. You don't need multiple people to have somebody coming after you and just say, all right, it's go. You got to deal with this person. But that can, 
I've, I've found that can help really test and bring somebody kind of back down to earth when it comes to what can I deal with? What gives me trouble? And I use it like as a troubleshooting guide for, all right, what are the attacks that are succeeding against you? Let's work up on how you can deal with those better so that you have confidence there. So I guess you could kind of call it a competition, but if somebody did attack you for real, that they've started a competition with you. And it's the question of how you deal with it. You don't necessarily need to slip, slip into the mindset of, I have to destroy this person utterly, but there does have to be an element of, I have to not be destroyed. I have to have the will to make sure that I survive this. And, um, and not just what technique can I rattle off or can I think of, but there has to be a, this is serious. If I don't take care of this, I could be the victim here. And, and that's, I think, something that, that exists within that, what we were talking about earlier, the, is the martial art built for self-defense or is it capable of performing in a self-defense venue? Um, what would you both say to, to that concept of the mindset? Well, you know, this, I think the, there's a, a fundamental issue uh, that Aikido struggles with. And that is that Osensei originally worked with people pre-war who were accomplished martial artsmen already. And they took on Ueshiba's Aikido, as I understand, as supplemental training. Mm -hmm. And it was already assumed that they had been tempered and they knew how to deal with people who would come at them with a surprise attack or something that was, you know, completely uh, uh, unrehearsed and they just would spontaneously attack you, whether they sparred or, or went to war and practiced on the battlefield or, and then were lucky enough to survive and come home. But it was that type of an individual that Osensei taught Aiki to. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, my take, and maybe Ellis can, can uh, shed more light on it, I may be mistaken here, but I always felt that uh, once the, there was the war and martial arts were outlawed to some extent in Japan, but they allowed Aikido, I think that uh, both uh, Toei Sensei, Koichi Toei and Kishomaru Ueshiba, they uh, basically took O Sensei's art and made it something that anybody could practice, could come in and, and, and work on. Mm -hmm. That in, uh, someone with no martial art background could come into the dojo and get uh, physically tempered and learn something about a martial temperament and, and, and that kind of a thing. But uh, there wasn't competition involved. And uh, it wasn't, uh, it was the type of thing a 60 year old man could come in, 70 year old person could come in, men and women could train together. You could have people of different, without no weight categories. And uh, they developed a system and there was an under, a, a philosophical underpinning to Aikido that was beautiful. And people could come into the dojo and work on themselves and somehow develop their core and become stronger people and apply that to whatever profession they went into, which is a beautiful thing. And there were the few who could actually take th that bit of Aikido and actually turn it into something martial. You have guys like uh, Kato Sensei that Ellis uh, mentioned, had never studied any other martial arts. Mm -hmm and yet became really formidable martially through just the, uh, the classical practice of Aikido. A guy like that is a genius, mm -hmm. you know? And for, but I, I would say for, for many, it's really hard to connect the dots like that with what you're given, you know, uh, with what, I, I, you know, with what uh, Ueshiba sends uh, Kisho Maru, and Toei presented, it was, it took a really uh, creative person to be able to, uh, to use that martially, uh, perhaps self-defense, but in crossing over with other hardcore skilled martial artists 
you know, it's very difficult to do. But yet, uh, that wasn't the appeal for uh, Kishomaru or Toei Sensei. They were trying to appeal to the common, per to the common person, your rank and file accountant, doctor, a business person, housewife, to, uh, to through the martial practice, to develop their core mm -hmm. and to bring this to whatever they did in their lives and to keep a healthy, strong body and an ability to focus. And, and, uh, and yes, and maybe find through that some balance in their life, whether it led to peace or, or, or whatever it might be, meditation of some kind. So that's the atmosphere that you find Aikido in. And um, really, and what I try to do is, is I, I just try to take it a step further. You know, so that, and as, you know, I, Ellis will tell you as well, there's a big difference between mixed martial arts or different martial arts fighting each other and self-defense for the common person, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah if I, I could, uh, yeah, sorry, ahead. just a couple points. Um, yeah. So, Tomiki Sensei, and if you want to have an idea what his Aikido was like, there's a film of him doing the Judo Goshinjutsu Kata, which was his adaptation of Aikido for Judo. It's 1957. Really rough. Really rough. Um, and his, he had a dishi his whole life, a guy named Oba, who was one of the most, everything I've heard, one of the epitome of what a good, strong man should be. Amazing, amazing. Cross-trained a lot of arts. Um, he figured into that famous demonstration in uh, Manchuria, where he thought, I have to respect O-sensei by attacking him for real. Mm. And he just went all out and tried to kill him. And Ueshiba managed him, but he didn't look pretty. And he was furious and uh, he was yelling, you idiot, and all this. And then this very famous Naginata teacher came out and said, oh, Ueshiba sensei, that was the best demonstration I've ever seen. Ueshiba, oh, really? <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, Oba had seen a demonstration of Daitodio with some of those, you know, remarkable phys uh, apparent physical feats. Mm -hmm. And he goes to Tomiki Sensei and says, Sensei, I just saw this Daito Yu thing. We come from Daito Yu. We don't do that. And Tomiki goes, I can do that stuff. And he does them all. Mm -hmm. um, and then Ova says, well, why haven't you taught us that? And Tomiki says, because it's antisocial. You could spend all your life trying to get all these skills, consuming yourself, and that's all you would do with your life. What I'm trying to do is teach people to be what Bruce Bookman just said, <laughs> right? Literally, right? I want to, we, we, we're after the war, we're trying to pick ourselves up on our feet. We need strong working citizens to build this country up again. Not a few people doing some hermetic obsessive study to do physical feats that you'll never need in your entire life. Mm -hmm. So that's the one side. The other side is, I have this in an appendix in Hidden in Plain Sight. It's an account of an uh, acquaintance of mine, a guy named Mike Scoss, who was working out with some French guy. Both of them were you know, pretty high up then in the Aikido pecking order. And Kishomaru sensei came over to the two of them and said, I want to show you something. And he said, you guys are going to be running dojos of your own someday back in your own country. And somebody's going to come in and try to break your dojo. So let me show you a few things. And as always happened when the teacher would teach, everybody gathers around. And Kishimura says, go back to practice. This isn't for you. And he teaches very precisely how to use a shihonage and orient yourself so you drop the guy right on the top of their head. Mm. And he's actually spotting these two guys so they could do it safely. And then he does the same thing with an Nage. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so everybody says, oh, Murihei didn't teach his son anything. Get right. right. He felt there's something else. You know, again, he, he was not physically a very massive guy or a strong guy. Uh, but yeah, he was taught this stuff. He just didn't feel that was where things were going. But it's a, it's a legitimate question now. That was self-defense. That was defending selves 
in Japan, a country with very little street crime, very little anything, right, at that time, defending self, self-defense. So here we are in America right now, and if these selves can't be defended with just that classical stuff, basically what Bruce was saying, how do we ex respect the art and extend those borders so that people are equipped to defend these 2020 selves mm -hmm. in America? That is a great question, you know, and it's one that, I, that after I started, open, I had my own dojo and I started evolving my, my art and ans wanting to answer that question, I had to sort of consider like, well, you know, you're creating an art like any military technology for a certain environment. You're creating it against uh, certain weapons or certain attacks, what have you. And I thought, you know, how would we do this against what we are going to expect to possibly be attacked by? And then as I started to study out more and, and get with people that have got a lot more experience with real live violence than I do, I sort of came upon the, well, what are the, the top five or 10 attacks people are likely going to run into, you know? And those ran all the way from, of course, the haymakers right near the top number one or two, uh, the powerful shoves, tackles and takedowns, you know, stuff you see in surveillance videos and uh, you, but things like bouncers deal with all the time, security people, police, they see a profile of here's what we are normally running into, or here's a set of things that you can expect. And I, as I saw those and I thought, why wouldn't Aikido or the approach of using efficiency and not just overwhelming brutality to deal with any of these, why would Aikido not be able to deal with those? And I couldn't come up with an answer that said, of course, Aikido can't deal with those. I think that it could. And, it, and not to say that it had the technique to do it, but certainly the mindset and the approach. I'm going to move, control the space, control my range, get into an advantage position, um, and be able to control the, the person's body or influence their movement to redirect it in a way that's going to allow me to be safe. And hopefully I can save them from, from harm. But, you know, maybe not. Uh, and so I thought with those approaches, as I looked at, at different arts, I saw, for example, wrestling has got a great Aikido approach to dealing with leg takedowns. It really does. They move off the line, usually above it. Uh, they redirect the incoming energy away and down. They get into a controlling position. It just doesn't look like normal Aikido, but the principles seem to be there and then move around into a control position. Of course, a, a competitive wrestler will want to re-engage and get into some kind of a pin. But from a self-defense standpoint, you get to the point where they're on the ground and you're standing, you can push off and get back. Like there's, there are ways to not necessarily get absorbed into Aikido being a set of techniques, but Aikido being what I think is like a strategic approach and a tactical approach. Does that, does that make sense? Well, it, it does to me. And what, what comes up really for me when I hear you speaking is all, all that's very good, especially watching the wrestlers and seeing that they're coming up with things that are very much like an Aikido technique. The training method mm -hmm. is the issue. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've been really working on. So how do you get an Aikidoist to to begin to respond spontaneously against more modern attacks. Mm -hmm. The approach that I use is you start with one thing at a time. Let's teach the people in the dojo how to snap a jab mm -hmm. and then have them put on just a glove on the one hand and have them practice snapping jabs at each other at various times and trying to trick each other not hard at first, just trying to touch the forehead maybe. And then slowly building it up until it's a crisp jab. And then the person learns how to move at times when they don't know exactly what time it's coming in, but they know that it's gonna be a jab. And they work on closing the distance on a jab. Then introduce the right cross and get to the point where there's a left jab and a right cross, but you don't know what's gonna happen first and you don't know what the timing, will it be two jabs and then a right cross? Mm -hmm. Will it be left and a right 
maybe they'll do something really weird, start off with a right and then come in with a left and change the distance and timing and get comfortable with that, closing the distance. Then add the haymaker. So now they have three punches that are possible. We're only gonna allow three punches and put them in this vacuum and get them spontaneous with those three things so that they can come in and put a kodagaishi on somebody. They can come in and maybe do a double leg. The double leg doesn't work. They slip around and go up into an iminaga, right? The <laughs> person comes in for a, for a double leg takedown and you were talking about, I think, a cross face, a wrestler's cross, cross face. face. or a sprawl or a frame. It's into Irimi Nage. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is practice it in a spontaneous way where the person's not overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. You can't start a person out saying, okay, use your Aikido techniques, and then boom, 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 boom. You, 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 you know, just start this, then that, and then it begins to build and then it depends on the individual. Where are they going to take it? You show them a methodology. Then you throw in a low kick. So now they got the left jab, the right cross, a haymaker. Maybe we start to get a little more sophisticated and they learn about a hook. It's hard to teach somebody a hook who's never done much punching, right? Then a low kick. And now, they get, now we're starting really to get a little spontaneous. And, the point where someone's ready to go for shodan in my dojo, that's the point I want to see them at. Mm -hmm. It's light. Nobody's trying to take over the other, take off the other person's head, but they're beginning to do something. And I'm not really sure that it's Aikido, but it may, at least in some small way, fill the gap in their background that O Sensei already had in the students. He was dealing with, of course, to a much greater degree, the pre-war people that O Sensei was dealing with. Give them in your dojo a little background and teach them how to, how to do a left jab, a cross, a hook, maybe a low kick, and let them build it. Then by the time they get to black, black belt level, they can start to, to reach out and branch out in different directions. Mm -hmm. But yet 90% of the time they're doing classical Aikido. And, and you know, that's a really good point about the 90% because one of the mistakes is to do too much freestyle, too much competition. Mm -hmm. um, to give you one quick example, um, I don't train nearly enough because of circumstances, but I've, one of my business associates is a guy named Don Gula, retired sergeant and founder of Arrestling, which is a mixed martial art for police and specific to law enforcement. And one of the drills we did was called a tactical two-step. We have airsoft guns and they're placed behind us each on a like table. And you're in a box about 10 feet wide and about six feet deep. And so is the other person and you're facing each other. And what you do is on a signal, you run to the table, get the weapon, put, uh, put the magazine in, you got to set it up and then you start firing each other with airsoft, you got eye protection, but that's it. And you know, when you get hit by those things, it hurts. And somebody's shooting at you. I was so scared, right? You know, it was like the first time I'd ever done something like that. I was a little bit shaky, building up to it. Oh my God, I'm gonna do this, do this. Then I did it, and of course, you know, once you're in it, it's what it is. But I also realized if we were gonna do this every day, it would become a game, mm -hmm. right? And when something becomes a game, you will get a training score. And the training score you get from a game is your brain says, this is all I ever have to expect. Mm -hmm. Right. And you know, that's so, I mean, like one of the things where I regularly doing Aikido, we do this in the Arakidu, um, is in our sparring. One of the guys is going to have a concealed weapon and or not, or both will. And you're in the middle of a grapple and all of a sudden the guy pulls a knife and you didn't expect that. And you have to respond to that too. There, if you only do one type of competition, it will become its own sterile practice, no matter how vital the competitive thing is. So that's a you, great way to describe the sport influence that I think is a concern. Is it get like it's, it gets that sterility to it? I agree. If you and you know, as long as there's uncertainty, you'll have an element of fear. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm going to die fear, but I don't know what's going to happen. I don't want to lose. I don't know what to expect. 
But if I'm, you know, my son's a former professional boxer. I watched him get in a ring with a scary guy, Michael Katsidis, who was ranked uh, number four, six, whatever. Really scary middleweight. And they were sparring. He was a sparring partner for a, a fight. Mm -hmm. I watched it and I was physically frightened for my kid just watching this. He wasn't, I asked him, he said, well, I had a little butterflies going in. But once I'm in the ring, no, because I know exactly what to expect. I know how to fight. I know how to be in the ring, right? So if you added another element, in the middle of this, somebody's going to throw in a, uh, uh, a baseball bat and you have to go for the baseball bat and continue. You build, everybody be terrified, mm -hmm. right? So I think if you really want to do combative training, it's not a matter of, okay, we're going to really grind in the, every day. We're going to do the equivalent of getting in the ring. Mm -hmm. Sparring, I believe, has to be rare enough that you still feel scared doing it and you don't want to be shamed and all that. And each time you do it, you change it one parameter. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. I think, that, I think that's accurate. You can do too much, spar spend too much of your training time with sparring. You can do too much with kata. You can do too much with um, scenario training, like for police officers and stuff, a lot will often do that kind of a thing. From a coaching standpoint, having a good blend that, that each of those things brings out different aspects and, and uh, facets of somebody's abilities. And, uh, and that's an important part of it. Um, and I do like the aliveness uh, aspect that, that Bruce was talking about, because I think that that's where doing too much kata and not any Giawaza or any type of a free form can really leave you, once you do get into a free form, you just feel like you're totally out of your element. Like the formula is gone and there isn't one. And so I think that's a good balance. You know um, what the Uchideshi used to do after hours? What's that? In the 60s, sumo. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was sumo and tanto. You know, Terry Dobson told me, you know, that, that was the main thing they did. They would, you know, when they had their leisure time and, and the senseis weren't around, they're all doing sumo, and then they throw a tanto in the mix, and they try to, you know, not get stabbed. Okay. So, and then the teacher might come, that's competition. It's not like they wanted to learn live training. Yeah. I think, I think most martial artists do to some degree. Yeah. obviously the different degrees but um well good i think there's one last question i want to ask we've been going a pretty good pretty good amount of time now and that is to have you to discuss a little bit of your collaborative training that you've been doing uh for some time now i know we we talked about that before the show and uh, perhaps one of you could get a start on kind of describing how you've worked together i know you touched on a little bit earlier ellis but uh maybe you could get on a little bit more detail well, um, I, uh, you know, Ellis and I lost contact for a long time. And, you know, it's really amazing how we both ended up in the same neck of the woods. And I uh, read uh, Dueling with O Sensei. Mm -hmm. And I was so impressed with it that I, I finally, I gave him a call. And I also read one of the other books that discussed, or maybe it was in Dueling with O-Sensei, where Ellis had talked about his sparring experience and his weapons training, and I was really interested in learning more about that. Mm. And uh, I also, you know, at that time, I, I wanted to actually have a training partner who I could just drill basic techniques with in jiu-jitsu. So I uh, wanted, I asked him if he was interested. Uh, I know we were at the 2005 uh, Expo with Stan Prannon uh, way back. And uh, we sat down, and I think we had a cup of coffee. I, we bumped into each other at the cafeteria. Um, so I, basically my, what I wanted to get from weapons work was I wanted to get some classical principles uh, that predate Aikido stuff, and just how to hold a sword, how to hold a jo, uh, what what are the things that should be considered in terms of mawai and timing, and I would like to cover rudimentary things like that and work with Ellis uh, to the point where perhaps we could spar a little bit or get to the point where 
I could uh, at least have bring to my Aiki weapons work a background uh, that again, most a lot of O-sensei students that he worked with, they had the background. And you can change things. You know, I, I just didn't want to change things from an aesthetic place. You know, I love the beauty of Aikido. And uh, perhaps one of my shortcomings is that the beauty is not there. I, I you know, I, I, I'm not as interested in it. You know, I, I love the, the art. And I, I love just the classical training as well. I could, if I didn't teach Aikido for a living, I probably would be pretty happy given that I could defend myself against a Japanese Aikido instructor wearing a gi. I don't have any other concerns for self-defense. I don't worry somebody's going to attack me with a knife or with a sword or, you know, whatever, you know. But um, so it would, in Jiba Sensei's uh, weapons work were really strong. Lots of really amazing things. I love it to this day. If I see footage of him, I still, it stops me and I, I'm so attracted to it. I, I love it. I almost don't know why, but I do. And at the same time, I uh, have so much respect for the things that Ellis does and this whole thing with Araki Ryu and pressure and how the pressure works and where the gaps are and how to take advantage of these things and develop a degree of spontaneity into the, uh, so you don't have a kata mind where things are always happening in a certain way, but you're stepping outside of it and almost sparring with the weapons. Mm. So I just wanted to get into that atmosphere and feel good. And Ellis has done a beautiful job uh, introducing me to some of these concepts. And I've just loved working with him. And uh, we've developed these katas now, both mm. sword and boken kata, or sword and jo kata. And we've uh, become collaborators together. We've come up with a series of endless loop katas where we just keep changing roles and we swap roles continuously throughout. Mm. And it's been a very creative process and I've been introducing it to my students. And we're getting ready just to, to, to bring it to everybody uh, soon. So anyway well that's great i'd love to to announce that when you've got something to uh when you get to that launch point that sounds very yeah. exciting well we've been sort of sneaking it out you know a little bit you know, <laughs> you know, yeah the one thing is there, you know Go ahead. one of our intentions was to make it open source so you know actually bruce and i do the same kata differently mm -hmm. you know we do the same waza differently we we it's like we got two engines uh, we put a, different engines for the same car. Um, now, what's been nice for me is, you know, one of my, uh, my own training, uh, you know, I have a group in Greece, which I'm going to graduate in Araki Ryu next year. Mm. At that point, they're independent. Mm. And I'm never going to teach the whole Araki Ryu curriculum again. Um, mm. uh, it takes too long. Uh, and people really, really have to be committed. But I've met people who, want to learn what I, some of what I do in Araki Ryu and they're established in their own martial arts. And so I, I, I developed this model I call Taikyoku Araki Ryu, which is a um, great themes Araki Ryu. And I've got a group down in uh, California, got another small group in uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, and what we do is we take one section of Araki Ryu and I give them everything because the way Araki Ryu works is like cutting up a pizza. Everything ends up in the center. The weapon use a different weapon, you got to figure out how to use the weapon. Principles are always the same. Mm -hmm. And so I have, with my uh, Taikyo Garaki groups, I'm using the kata that Bruce and I uh, develop, and I've arakified them. <laughs> uh, you know, the same posture, same feel to it, different body dynamics. And then I'm working with a group local that they used to be called Yabe Dyu Jiu-Jitsu, but about uh, 80 years ago, they were start calling themselves Yankee Yin Dyu, which I love. You know, you get it, right? Sure. Anyway, they're, they're gnarly guys about my age, and it's just a rugged Rhode Island, wrench the wrists and make sure they fall, American style Jiu-Jitsu. Get her done. It is wonderful. That's and cool. so they hit me up to do some Joe, and so I work with them, but again, I have this thing I say, respect the house. 
So I don't want to go in there and say, oh, we're going to change all your body dynamics. We're going to change how you, it's like, I'm going to give these forms and I'm watching the way they move. And I actually have an opportunity to learn their internal organization in trying to make the Joe conform to everything else they're doing. Mm. So it's become this wonderful platform that I can discourse across different martial arts. Bruce said one of the important components was how it's an endless loop. The last movement of one side is actually the first movement of the other side. So we can just go on until we drop. Nice. That sounds fascinating. The other cool thing is, I, I got to say, if you look at um, Shiba Sensei's Joe, for example, there's a few basic principles that are imbued throughout. If you look at Nishio Sensei's Joe, a few basic principles throughout. Saito Sensei's Joe. What we've tried to do is five Joe forms, five sword forms. Each one focuses or emphasizes some different principles. Like the very first of the, our Joe forms emphasizes very far mai. Um, almost what you would use, say, with a European longsword, like a helicopter blade kind of thing. The second is what happens if the person grabs your weapon and you're trying to manage them but stay outside? Hmm. The third is it's close enough that you use percussive explosive force. The fourth is a grappling in your face range. And then the fifth is, okay, we're going to take this into grappling from weapons. Mm. Right? And so, and then the kata becomes a platform. Like the, the fifth one was so damn simple. And it usually ends up with something like a waki gatame. But then the next level we have built in is, what if I try to resist his waki gatame? Well, I'm going to end up on the ground, you know, then what happens happens, right? Sure. So we wanted to build training that was also a platform, an adaptable platform. So when things go wrong, we could make it right again. Hmm. So that's, cool. that's what we're doing. That, that sounds really fascinating. You know, and as a, as a teacher, that's one of the things that I'd like to bring to my students that I've found is pretty rare or unusual, at least within Aikido, is teaching students what happens when, you're, when your technique fails. Like, what do you, how, do you, how do you recover and how do you get to something else and have the mindset of not everything's going to work all the time. You have a failure. Now you need to recover and, and make something else work. So I, I do like, love that sentiment. It's, if I could add just one more thing on this. Please do, yeah. Um, when you look at different martial arts anywhere, they always talk about the founder did this, the founder created this, he went off to the mountains, you know, she was in a nunnery and bored or whatever, right? It's always this one person. Occasionally you have a teacher and a close collaborator like Tomiki Sensei and Oba, but basically Oba was Tomiki's student, right, and supporting his vision. Mm -hmm. This is such a, a treasure that we are equal collaborators. Mm -hmm. Bruce blows me away with what he knows and what he can do, and I hope I engender some respect in return. Uh, it's, there's no knowledge holder who's bequeathing it to the other. It's, it's, it's like a conversation that never ends. Uh, it's, 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 it's one of the best things I've ever done in my life, martial arts wise, best. I think there are great things coming in the world of all martial arts when they take on this open source type of approach, because it, it just had, there's so much benefit to be had as people share their ideas and they flush out the things that work for them. Um, you know, I think the pyramid shaped authority that trickles down the knowledge really acts as a bottleneck. And to avoid that bottleneck, as people get together with, with robust backgrounds and, and even just incredible talent, I've seen some young people come out with incredible things that nobody really thought about or forgotten about or rediscovered that can bring, it, bring what they've discovered into the martial arts world or within their sphere of influence can have great effect. And, uh, and I think that that is a, a, a fantastic way forward. Yeah, and if I can add one more thing, it's, you know, bringing, again, we're talking about the scent of practice, the, the feeling, the whole, uh, 
nature, the quality of it, the personality of the practice. And Aikido has a quality to it that is somebody who really loves it and loves the practice and can be at various different levels, but there's a whole feel and something that's almost indescribable. Mm -hmm. And what I appreciate about Ellis and my collaboration is that I feel that we maintain that feeling. And that's what makes it Aikido, is that, uh, that unmistakable quality that's so hard to describe that, that, that makes it Aiki. I, I feel that we have engendered in our, our practice of weapons work. Well, that's fantastic. I'm really looking forward to, to uh, seeing what you two have flushed out together. That, that sounds pretty exciting. So if, uh, we'll kind of wrap it up. Is there anything you, uh, both of you would like to say and uh, to kind of wrap up this great conversation? Yes, I'd like you to, uh, I'd like all the people who watch this, if you're interested in some of the uh, practical application that I do and really uh, forming a methodology for starting this process in your own Aikido training, uh, check out Aikido Extensions at the Aikido Journal. It's the Aikido Academy. Mm -hmm. uh, please do that and uh, keep your eye open, peeled for the work that uh, Ellis and I will be uh, presenting. Excellent. I'll put a link in the description for the video as well. Great. Thank you. So for my part, um, you know, a lot of the way I can't, you know, I have a very limited uh, teaching range. You know, I have a couple people in my backyard and I go, I travel to a couple places. And so one of the ways I, I reach people is through my writing. Mm -hmm. And if I could plug that. Um, yeah, please do. Uh, not only my martial arts writing, but um, my tactical de-escalation or how to talk people down uh, from aggressive states. Mm -hmm. Uh, my novel, <laughs> The Girl with the Face of the Moon, and the second novel coming out this year. Uh, anyway, all my writing, edgeworkbooks.com, E-D-G-E-W-O-R-K, books, oh, it's all one word, edgeworkbooks.com. And then not only my shorter writing, shorter essays, but I have a just a cadre of ever-expanding, incredible writers, knowledgeable in areas that I'm not who write on my, uh, uh, my blog, which is called kogenbudo.org. Kogen means old new. So K-O-G-E-N-Budo.org. And there are just, uh, gosh, we have a, a, an article on Jogo de Pau, which is uh, um, uh, Portuguese stick fighting. I've got an article coming up on Bonote, which is, I'd never even heard of it until this year. And it's a traditional farmer's practice, which is a pseudo dance, pseudo martial art that peasants, it kept pe peasants weapon wieldy, right? Mm -hmm. They wouldn't be doing martial arts because they couldn't act like Bushi, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, they're sort of dancing and doing flamboyant stuff. And it was a way to keep the peasants handy if it was ever necessary. There's just all these great people. So that's kogenbudo.org and you can really read some cool stuff. Great. I'll put those links in the, in the description of the video as well. Thank you. So, well, thank you very much, gentlemen. This has been a fascinating conversation. So I very much appreciate you uh, taking the time and, and having this, this great chat. And I look forward to doing it again soon. And definitely let me know. We can maybe do another, another chat like this when you're coming to release time and let everybody know uh, what you've got coming out and, and how to get to it. Cool. Thank you, Kristen. Excellent. Thank you. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Right. Thank you very much for watching and supporting this podcast. Enjoy your training. <laughs>